you know, we often hear from everybody and I heard growing up as a kid, you know, a oh, Weatherby. I've always wanted to own a Weatherby. Started in 1945 and, and really it was his passion for high velocity cartridges that the really is why we're here today. I'm yeah, all our rifles now are guaranteed sub MOA, Vanguard's Mark Fives, whatever it is, if it's got our name on it. And, you know, I, I put my name on that rifle, my, my family's name on that rifle, and I don't take it lightly. And it was the ammo is what started our company. It's one thing that sets us apart. We have 14 proprietary cartridges. I mean, find me a 30 cal that's faster than the 3378. Find me a 6.5 that's faster than the 65300. Find a 25 that's faster than the 257. You start to look at those and you go, it, you know, su you know, ballistic superiority is what we call it, is who Weatherby is. We're going to be announcing um, a significant part in the Weatherby history, um, and that is we are going to be relocating from California to the state of Wyoming. Welcome to the RNA Outdoors podcast, fueled by Ripcord Arrow Rest and First Light Hunting Apparel. At RNA, we are a public land DIY conservationists that love to share our passion for the outdoors. So join us and our team as we interview professionals in the industry to share insight knowledge that helps make hunters and anglers more successful. Hey listeners, subscribers, and fellow outdoorsmen and women. This is your host, Lucas Paw, and I'm excited to tell you about some of the sponsors that continue to help make this podcast not only happen, but grow and thrive in this digital world of audio content. This podcast is brought to you by Ripcord Arrow Rest, the bow hunter's number one fall away rest on the market. Ripcord is known for 100% full-time arrow containment in their patented drop dead brake system that eliminates launcher bounce back. Best of all, Ripcord is backed by their rock solid guarantee. If the original owner has a part break for any reason, it will be repaired or replaced at no charge. And did I mention, Ripcord is located in Southwest Montana where all their products are made with pride in America. Check them out at ripcordrs.com and on their social media feeds. This podcast is brought to you by First Light Clothing and Hunting Apparel. Born in the Rockies in central Idaho, First Light's mission is to create simple yet proven versatile gear that provides comfort and performance in any situation while working to promote the pursuit of ethical hunting and stewardship. I recently joined the First Light Pro Staff team and have continued to be impressed year after year in their innovations in engineering and merino wool fabrics. Ten years ago, they started putting out wool fabrics with camo patterns and immediately this changed the game. Since then, they offer multiple layering systems and kits in various proprietary patterns and continue to raise the bar with their competition. Find them online at firstlight.com or under their social media feeds. Go farther, stay longer. Welcome, listeners, to the RNA Outdoors podcast. I'm your host, Lucas Pa, coming to you from a busy day two here uh, in Reno at the uh, Wild Federation Sheep Show. Uh, just again, another really neat trade show. Um, enjoy being here, meeting up with a lot of people, uh, catching up with uh, a lot of outfitters uh, and friends. Uh, and more importantly, I think it's important to to think about what you know everyone does for one species of animal, which is the sheep. And it's incredible uh, what you know when you get a bunch of people together, uh, what they can do to preserve uh, such a special animal uh, on the North American country. So, anyway, I'm here today with a really special guest. Um, it's kind of funny when I was reading through the uh, Wild Sheep uh, magazine, which is a quarterly magazine, I was going through and uh, saw an article that uh, Adam Weatherby had submitted on his California bighorn in Oregon. 
And uh, what's kind of funny about that is, is Adam and I basically live and work within a stone's throw from each other. And uh, it took us to get to Reno to try to finally get on and, and do a podcast. But uh, he's busy, and, and obviously we're all pretty busy with schedules. But uh, um, just, again, um, really thankful and, and uh, happy to have Adam on the uh, show today. So, Adam, welcome to the RNA Outdoors podcast. Thanks, Lucas. Great to finally yeah, finally good. be here on the on the podcast. Good with to you. connect. Yeah. yeah. So uh, here in Reno, you guys got a uh, booth there. Um, you got quite a bit of products out. You know, you guys don't sell to the consumer at these shows. Basically, they can hold the hold the rifles, hold the shotguns, see the new products. Right. We actually this this weekend are launching. Funny you ask that. Um, we're launching an an online kind of custom configurator where you can actually kind of build your own rifle. Um, and uh, so we're actually kind of playing around with that this weekend. So we actually may sell indirectly few guns obviously it's got to go through an ffl and all those things but mainly we're here just for branding so folks can come by and take a look at it see what's new talk to us and all that kind of stuff yeah 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 the trade show season's always neat because it's a good time to see the new products for for the new year and uh, also catch up uh from the previous year so um adam just to kind of kick it off maybe um tell us a little bit about yourself uh you know obviously the weatherby name um and the lineage behind that goes back many years um your father your grandfather but uh, maybe just talk a little bit about you growing up as a kid uh, in the family with that last name sure no, I mean, it's, you know, I always refer to it, it is in the outdoor space and in the hunting world, it's it's a legacy, you know, that I um, feel blessed to have been, you know, kind of born into, um, certainly, and especially if you love the outdoors, you know, I always say, you know, my grandpa could have started a toilet paper company or something else, it just wouldn't have been quite as fun. Yeah. So I'm um, <laughs> pretty blessed to have, um, you know, be able to come in, not only to have it be just, you know, kind of a rifle shotgun ammo company, but to have it be kind of a premium brand and you know, we often hear from everybody and I heard growing up as a kid, you know, oh, Weatherby, I've always wanted to own a Weatherby, you know, and, or you tell people on the phone or customer service, like, hey, what's your name, sir, or whatever, and Weatherby, oh, like the gun? Yeah, and then you kind of don't even tell them who you are, and they just go, man, I've always wanted to own one, or my dad owned one, and or it's the Mercedes or the Cadillac of guns, and, you know, so it's those kind of things um, that I kind of grew up in knowing that it was a pretty special thing, you know, I think, to, to be a part of the Weatherby family. Yeah. Was being in the outdoors always normal for your family? I mean, you know, Mm -hmm. out bird hunting and doing a lot of things with your family. Was that pretty normal as a kid? Absolutely. It was probably not as much as people would think only from the standpoint of, so my grandpa started the company in 1945. It was in Southern California, which was fairly rural at the time. It was a different place than Southern California is today, right? The concrete jungle. So I did grow up down there my early life till my dad moved it up to the central coast of California where we're at. And I know, you know, you well know we can get out, shoot pigs and deer and different things. So I did, but we'd have to travel to, I mean, there just wasn't a lot right in our backyard. So, um, you know, when I was real young, um, you know, we'd have to, we'd have to travel or go out of state to do it. Um, you know, I didn't grow up in Montana as a kid like you did and didn't have that opportunity, but there were plenty of opportunities with my dad for out of state stuff and, you know, all those kind of things, just, um, you know, going after elk and deer and whatnot growing up. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. So thinking about the history of the name and I guess really your grandpa's legacy, you know, the Mark five action, the Vanguard action, maybe talk a little bit about, you know, kind of how that, um, you know, came to form during that time in those days. Sure. You know, he, he started in 1945 and, and really it was his passion for high velocity cartridges that the really is why we're here today having this conversation. It wasn't even about the guns themselves. Um, it wasn't initially about the beauty of the guns or the function or whatever. It was, it was, uh, he was all about getting bullets to move faster. And, um, that was kind of his obsession that really drove into his passion, you know, which was this business. And so, um, you know, he took cases and developed his own cases and, um, you know, different things started chambering people's other people's rifles for it. And it was really like a custom, you know, custom uh-huh. gun builder that um, would uh, take Mauser actions and different things and, you know, make them into his 300 Weatherby or 270 Weatherby, 257 in the early days and, um, you know, really started there. And that's kind of that's kind of how things were born. It was, I mean, really hand, hand loading and building custom guns in his garage. And that's kind of how things got started in the early forties. So, and then your dad, you know, comes into play, you know, and, and I think I always think of your dad and the legacy there is, you know, shotguns and, you know, he was a wing shooter and and did a lot of bird hunting. Maybe speak a little bit about to your dad's, you know, legacy with, with Weatherby. Sure. I mean, my grandpa was a pioneer that started it, you know, and so for the forties, fifties, sixties, I mean, it was all my grandpa. And then, you know, my dad really, you know, came into the scene in the seventies and so seventies, eighties, nineties, and the, you know, early part of this thing, you know, my dad was there, my grandpa passed away in 88. So, um, it was, um, you know, but my dad kind of took over in the early eighties 
and a lot of his influence was really branching into other things, you know, as passionate as my grandpa was about everything. Um, you know, it was also when you found a company like that and different things too, it's hard to let your son come up with ideas. So sure. he, uh, you know, remember 1983 when we came out with our first non-wood stock, it was, you know, my grandpa wouldn't have it. You know, it's like, dude, people don't buy guns that look like this. Like you yeah. need fancy wood on it. My dad's like, no, I'm pretty sure like this might be where things are going. And my grandpa's like, no, Ed, this is ugly. Like nobody's going to buy this. So it was my dad coming out and going, taking that first thing where my grandpa's like, this is what a rifle should be. And it was for years, um, to my dad kind of, um, you know, whether it was, uh, some of the shotgun development and different partnerships that we had in the shotgun world to synthetic stocks, to really kind of branching, you know, even into, um, you know, our 3378 and 338, 378 calibers in the 90s. Uh, he brought the Mark V back over to the U.S., you know, which has been huge for us. So really taking a great foundation that my grandpa started and really expanding it, making it wider, you know, yeah. where we were a bit more narrow before, which is good. You need that for an organization. And then my dad kind of took it and, and kind of branched it out into some other areas. So Yeah, so then last year at SHOT Show, there was a large, big announcement that uh, your dad uh, was, I wouldn't necessarily say stepping down, but kind of relinqu- relinquishing the business over to you. Maybe talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I'd been COO for a few years before that and had really kind of been um, driving the day-to-day business a lot as he was like, hey, Adam, I've been doing this for like 40 years and kind of kind of ready to do something else for a while, you know? And I mean, he's still passionate about the business. We talk multiple times a week. Um, you know, he actually ended up moving up to Oregon, um, him and my mom, and they're building a place up there. And I think just kind of was ready for a restart. He'd been kind of shackled down to the business for so long that he's like, all right, well, Adam, here you go. <laughs> and uh, Took off. But we're all on the phone probably every day. And he calls in for executive meetings and different things and part of big decisions, which sure. is great. So I can lean in on that. But we have a great relationship, um, a mutual trust, a mutual respect where, you know, he respects just like he remembers having to do with his dad. Sure. Um, he has that, uh, that understanding, you know, from where I'm at as well. And we just, we have a great relationship together. We love hunting together, love making business decisions together. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a good partnership, which is, you don't always have in a family business. Sure. So. And sometimes it can go, Sideways. it can go both ways, right? Yes. Especially in a family business. Yeah. Was the transition, was it pretty seamless for you? Was it difficult or kind of thinking through in the last year how how that's gone sure sure i mean it was uh you know frankly in our industry in the firearms industry 17 wasn't a banner year for most companies and you know you look at the publicly traded companies and things are down quite a bit and um, we were down in 17 so you know ironically it's like well here you go adam and you know there was a it was a it was a tough year um you know just from a pure business standpoint and what the market did and you know post 16 elections and just sure. a lot of things that happened and prices driving down and rebates and just a lot of over inventory some different things so so it was certainly a challenging year from from that aspect of it um you know from running the team at weatherby we got a you know great team assembled and so that's been you know that's been great doing that and just kind of you know, leading the charge and leading the team and, and heading forward comes, I guess, natural to me um, in that sense. Um, but I still rely on those who've, you know, spent a lot more years in the industry than me to, you know, help like my dad. So. When you build a good team, I always think about that, you know, whatever the business is, if it's a sports team, I mean, if you've got good people around you, right. you can exchange leadership and where you can put someone in that position and, and still right. maintain the day-to-day business. And, you know, I'm not an expert really in anything. It's like, I know I can communicate I can cast a vision, come up with a plan. I can, you know, build a good team, um, you know, communicate. But I'm not an expert in accounting. I'm not an expert in manufacturing. I'm not an expert in marketing. But fortunately, I have those people uh, on my team. And yeah. uh, and if we can come together and collaborate together, which we do, um, you know, a lot of it's just... And that's the, the benefit of being a family-owned company. And we don't have to go to, you know, some big corporate board or a private equity group, whatever it is. It's like we make the decisions and we sit around and sometimes they're good ones and sometimes they're not, but we're not afraid to fail. Um, we're not afraid to, afraid to fall down and get back up. But that's, um, you know, I think that's a bit of why we're still around today, 73 years later and still family owned. And that is a unique thing in our industry today to have somebody for that many years, you know, still around and and hasn't sold or gone under or, you know, whatever. Very successful, right. And, you know, in California and the States, you know, that you guys have operated in, uh, Mm -hmm. which sometimes can be a challenge, but you guys have definitely stood up to that challenge. So, um, let's talk a little bit about the products. Um, and again, we can just kind of give a high level overview, um, and, and kind of thinking about, you know, the rifle. So one of the things I know that I've always been intrigued with, with Weatherby is, is when you get a rifle out of the box that, you know, it, it's got that minute to minute and a half MOA out of the box. Sure. And, and so thinking about manufacturing, you know, how do you guys build a rifle 
with a tolerance where you can say out of the box you'll guarantee it'll shoot at you know a one inch at 100 yards sure yeah all our rifles now are guaranteed sub moa vanguards mark fives whatever it is if it's got our name on it and you know, it's funny. We were the first to come, one of the first back when to come out with a guarantee when it was an inch and a half. And everybody's like, whoa, that's crazy. And now you get all these custom guys that are guaranteed half or sometimes quarter. And you're like, wow. Yeah. You know, and, and um, so it is, you know, certainly, uh, you know, it's a lot that goes into it. Accuracy is one of those things you can just, you know, really chase. I mean, there's so many, you know, it's, it's the barrel, it's the load. You know, there's so many different parts um, to accuracy, but we... We want to be able to have a gun, you know, shoot and shoot right out of the box. And if not, we guarantee it. And, um, you know, it is certainly we have to partner with good people. There's, you know, tight tolerances in our manufacturing. Um, it's constant testing, constant, constant R&D to make sure that, you know, our products are um, up to the standard that they should be at. You know, like my dad has always said, it's in one of our big videos. He says, you know, I, you know, I, I put my name on that rifle, my, my family's name on that rifle, and I don't take it lightly. And so I think, you know, when we when we do something like that, um, we're not early to launch something if we're not, you know, confident that it's going to perform the way we want it to perform. So Thinking about the, the Mark V action to me has always kind of been, I think at the time almost became the flagship model and has yes. always kind of been, in my opinion, the 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 highest standard built that you can get maybe speak a little bit to that mark five action sure no absolutely i mean it is our flagship it certainly is today so my you know my grandfather in the early years for the first dozen years or so was chambering other people's rifles like mausers and stuff like that and and so in 1958 is when he got a team of engineers together and launched the mark five and his whole thing was i want the strongest smoothest action out there um and you know those nine locking lugs and the 54 degree bolt lift and um, you know, some of the kind of trademark things, the fluted, you know, fluted bolt body and were some of the things that really stood out, you know, at the time. And it's one of those, you know, few things left kind of that are really um, has stood the test of time. And yeah. so, um, you know, a couple of years ago, we in uh, 15, 16, we kind of did some updates to the Mark V. We came out with a new trigger. Um, it was during our 70th year. So we're 73rd year now, but during our 70th year of business, um, came out the new trigger. We reshaped the stock. We started, um, hand lapping all the barrels in the Mark fives, which is more of a custom feature. Uh, you know, what the Mark five is, is it sits at the upper end of production. It's not an entry level rifle. Um, you know, you're not going to buy it out, you know, well, I won't say any store names. You're not going to buy it at a cheap store. I mean, a Mark five is, is it's, it's a good rifle and you're going to pay, you're going to pay for what you get. And so we're, we kind of try to put a lot of custom features and different things like say, whether it be the accuracy guarantees or whether it be, you know, a hand lap barrel, things that you would expect out of a custom rifle we put in a production rifle. And so, um, we don't, you know, make a bazillion of them, but the ones we do make, we're really proud of and the yeah. ones we do make have a lot of features. And so we try to be really try to own that high end production, really entry level custom world is, is kind of a unique space. There's a, a lot of real kind of cheap guns out there and there's a lot of real high end, high end guns out, out there. And we think for that guy who wants a lot of value, you know, that's in there um, with the legendary kind of reputation of the Mark V, that it, it sits in a pretty sweet spot. Yeah. No, yeah. it's, I've always thought it's been the, one of the smoothest actions, you yeah. know, uh, on the market, at least from a from a consumer standpoint. Um, thinking about the Vanguard, I, I have quite a few Vanguards, and, and I've shot many Vanguards. And, uh, you know, I've, I've attended a lot of dinners where, you know, like NRA dinners and Mule Deer dinners, it, you know, Vanguards, we see a lot of them at the dinners, but um, they've always been consistently good good firearms are, and, yeah. and uh you know different price point obviously than the mark five but uh, maybe speak a little bit to the vanguard uh and and what it has to offer sure I mean, we originally introduced it 1971 it was my grandpa's idea that we did need something that that was a bit more affordable you know that more people could step into and an entry-level product for weatherby anyways and that's what the vanguard was i mean they're awesome barrels hammer forge barrels i mean they're just accurate always have been they're super dependable um, you know, so what we've tried to do is, is, um, you know, really where say it might start at, you know, 500 bucks and go north of a thousand bucks, um, you know, that, that we want it to be a great value for somebody. A lot of people own a Vanguard first and later get a Mark five. And yeah. so, you know, there's that kind family of, of things there. between it. Exactly. And what we've done the last couple of years is introduce a lot of new models that aren't at the entry, entry level, you know, to be honest with you in our industry, the last couple of years, um, as far as bolt action rifles are concerned, They've just gotten really inexpensive. And uh, most of your U.S. manufacturers have come out with very inexpensive um, entry-level bolt-action rifles. A uh, couple things to say about that is, A, we can't compete at that level. Um, we're, not, we're just not that big. And, um, and B, it's just really not in best interest of our brand. And so we've made a strategic decision. We can't fight 
at the bottom, bottom level. Um, and our Vanguard can't go there and we don't have anything that will, and we won't have anything. I don't believe ever that will. Yeah. Um, and so what we've done is we've tried to say, actually that space is so crowded at the bottom that really what we want to do is take that Vanguard and, and just add more and more features to it that people are, are looking for. So for instance, you know, you got a first light jacket on, we just launched last Friday, yeah. the first light Vanguard. Yeah. It's, um, you know, it's a great stock. It's got the first light fusion pattern on it. It's got a fluted barrel on it. Um, it's Cerakoted flat dark earth. It's got a muzzle brake on it. Um, and that's a thousand dollar Vanguard. Um, but it's got, I mean, it's lightweight. It's got the flutes. I mean, it's cool looking. It is, um, it's yeah. got the features. And so that's a place I think, you know, where we're really doing well with our Vanguard. Um, are those kind of unique, you know, things like that. Now it's not a, it's not a Mark five or it's not a custom gun, but it's also not, just an all black gun that you bought because it was the cheapest one on the shelf. And so it's, um, and it's guaranteed to be accurate. And to be honest, they are, I mean, they just shoot. So yeah. And the, I just think the characteristics, I mean, there's multiple patterns you guys are coming out with, with the stock patterns, um, different options that the Vanguard, you know, comes with. So there is, you know, the lower end model and then you can get the higher end model if you choose. So, but yeah, yeah I, I, recently noticed the first light edition I thought was pretty neat with, yeah. the, with the fusion pattern on it. So I thought you'd like that. Yeah, no, I do like that. It's pretty neat. I might need to put one of those in my gun safe. Yeah. Um, switching gears a little bit, um, in the shotgun front, um, you know, I, I, I've always thought in, in, in my mind, you know, the PA08 has always kind of been that, you know, it's like you got the Remington 870, you got just those standard shotguns. And to me, that PA08 has always kind of been that, you know, that shotgun for me from a Weatherby standpoint, just that, you know, solid, you know, pump action shotgun. Yeah. No, we've, you know, we have, um, we, we actually probably didn't know this, otherwise it told told you before the podcast we actually just discontinued the pa weight. really i don't know if you knew that no, yeah. i didn't know that and part of that was just some supplier complications and different things where we've and we just to be honest um our semi-auto business is doing really well uh-huh. and so we're introducing more and more in the semi-auto world so we have gas operated semis right now inertia ones which you know our new one our element um and then our over and under orion you know is where our focus yeah, is in that and trying pretty. to you know we know when we put our name on it you know people have that reputation of what the mark five has and all those things and what we always say about our shotguns is we um you know we say they're endurance tested field proven and the idea is that if we put our name even on a pump shotgun or semi-auto shotgun and we might have pumps again you know i mean it's just from time to time things excuse me things change but the idea is we can't jeopardize the reputation of a mark five or a custom mark five yeah you know over a 500 hundred dollar shotgun or something sure. and so it has to be something that people um really can trust and so you know we we put a lot of um, effort into that from our engineering and, you know, really, qu- you know, quality assurance to make sure that it's up to our standards and things. Um, yeah. But uh, our element, our new inertia shotgun has been doing well, and we're really excited about that, having a waterfowl or, a, you know, wood and synthetic, and it's a smooth, I mean, I like inertia shotguns, so um, smooth shooting. Thinking gun. about the, you know, the bolt-action rifles and the shotguns in that market, you know, like you said, you know, 16 was, was a bit of an off year. You know, we changed leadership with sure. the country, but yeah. are you guys seeing one overtake the other or is it is it a is a momentum thing is it every three to five years that one does well and one of rifles and shotguns yeah, right between rifles yeah, and shotguns it, things do pivot back and forth and you know we, we're not in you know much of the semi-auto the ar pistols and there's all that kind of stuff but everything pushes everything else so it's just it's interesting where so when you know uh, say the prices of the ars went down everybody was pushing those that ends up affecting other things that we sell because it clogs up distribution or dealers have them. You know, I always say a guy goes into a a gun shop and says, Hey, I was looking to get my first deer rifle. And the guy goes, well, I don't have one of those, but I have this AR right here and it's half off. You want this instead. Pretty soon the guy's walking out with that. And so, um, you know, so it, everything does kind of drive everything else a little bit. Um, over and under, uh, has actually been surprisingly solid right now where, you know, your double barrel market and typically isn't huge. I mean, most people would rather have a pump or a semi, um, but Orion's doing pretty well. It's in a unique price point where, um, you know, it's below a lot of the high end Italian stuff on the price point wise. And it kind of sits in there. Ruger used to have their red label. Um, they discontinued it. So there's not a lot in there. So if a guy's wanting a good value, a good name on an over and under shotgun that Orion's selling pretty well. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we still get today and we sell thousands of shotguns a year and people still come up to us today and go, Oh, I didn't know you made shotguns. Like we are known as a rifle and ammo company. And it's just funny. We've been doing since the sixties, we've had shotguns yeah, and, uh, we've had ones made all over the world and all sorts of them is still people. It's the Mark five and a 300 Weatherby, you know, that's what people see us as. What people so. remember. Yeah. It's, yeah. It, it is crazy to, to think about, you know, 
not only in all manufacturing companies, but uh, you know what they do manufacture, and and sometimes the consumers are so locked into what they see or what they yes. know, right? They they just go to the the ammo store and buy you know whether it be ammo. That right. Little do they know that there's you know a shotgun or rifle that that could go into, right? Yeah. And and I think for us, I mean, you know, we we always kind of forget and we think ammo is this add on. Oh, we make guns, and you know, I always have to remember we actually started out. It was ammo first. It was the ammo is what started our company. It's one thing that sets us apart. We have 14 proprietary cartridges. I mean, find me a 30 cal that's faster than the 3378. Find me a 6.5 that's faster than the 6.5300. Find a 25 that's faster than the 257. You start to look at those and you go, it, you, know, su- you know, ballistic superiority is what we call it, is who Weatherby is. And um, we're not known as the most efficient or cheapest ammo. I'm not saying it's going to burn less powder. And I'm not going to say it's going to, but I will say it's the fastest. Yeah. And it's a fact. It's physics. You can prove it. And so even la- uh, a couple of years ago, we came out to 65300. You know, um, and to be honest with you, just from a business thing, we, we come out with new cartridges. That doesn't just sell ammo. That sells guns. And, uh, and that's who we are uniquely. And we have to look at, okay, what does Weatherby have to offer unique? So, you know, we're going to be doing more in that cartridge development and in more of those things because people look to us to kind of pave the way and in cartridge development and in, you know, kind of superior velocity. So Speaking of the 6.5s, the, yeah. that kind of that whole movement, the Creedmoor, the 284, the 300, um, and, and maybe just a little bit on your thought around, you know, long range shooting and the ethics of long range shooting. I know that's always kind of been controversial in the hunting industry. Right. You know, some people support it and some don't, but you guys obviously clearly manufacture guns that have that capability. Maybe yeah. what, what, what are your thoughts on, on, on that part Absolutely. of the, the business? I think, you know, as technology has advanced, it has, um, it, it has enabled the equipment to be able to handle, you know, uh, longer shots. It doesn't necessarily mean that the Indian behind the bow, you know, is any better, sure. um, or the nut behind the bolt or however you say it, you know, it's still the hunter that it comes down to. But I think, um, you know, for us, um, you know, there's different factors that come into long range shooting. I mean, there's wind obviously, and, um, you know, how, you know, tight does your gun shoot? Um, but one of the hugest factors is drop. And so, you know, kind of what I, um, got a friend, Mark Thompson, who runs a long range shooting school, Thompson long range out of Logan, Utah. And his whole thing, he reminds me like five, 10 times says, Adam, you got to remember what your grandpa did for you is he like, you know, coming up with these cartridges and doing these things is like, man, he just eliminated the number one factor that you try to, you know, factor in. And that is how much drop, like your drop is so much less. Yeah, and elevation. when you're shooting out to a thousand yards, the drop is so much less. And furthermore, it carries the energy out further. So what it does is if you have a minimum foot pounds of energy that you think can provide for an elk or for a deer, whatever game you're a wild sheep, whatever game you think that is, that you're now carrying that out further. And so you're as far as the capability of the energy in, in stopping an animal and in, you know, penetrating into vitals, you're able to extend that out further. So you talk about a 6.5 Creedmoor versus a 6.5 300, um, you're hundreds of yards further of carrying out, you know, it, you know, foot pounds of energy that can take down an animal. And so that's, so that's kind of where we enter the scene on that. Now, um, even with wind or even with, um, you know, um, a density altitude or different elevation. things like that and elevation, yeah. all of those things are less when you have a flatter shooting cartridge. So in other words, if I'm moving faster, my six five three hundred versus my Creedmoor, not only is there less drop, wind's going to push it less. I mean, bullet for bullet, same bullet with the same BC on it. It's going to drop less. Wind's going to blow it less. Elevation's going to matter less. And so a hunter's capable range, I believe, with a, a, a product that shoots flatter is going to be carried out further. Um, I mean, if you dope the wind and you're off by a little bit, you're off by less with a six, five, 300 than you are. I'm not, I love six, five Creedmoor. I'm trying to put that down. I'm just saying, um, you know, that it, our cartridge is able to go out further now. And then with our optics technologies and, you know, syncing things in and Bluetooth and your apps and, you know, you know, dialing things in, it's taking it where the systems, the ammo rifles, the scopes are there. Now it does come back to, there's still the human element to it. And uh, I mean, what I believe personally is unless I can the majority of the time hit a pie plate the size of an animal's vitals at that distance in the same way I'm going to shoot, because usually I don't take a bench into the field. So I think a lot of guys practice at the bench and then go out and want to shoot, you know, long range. It means if I'm going to use a bipod, if I'm going to use standing sticks, if I'm going to, you know, go prone, what am I going to do in that same position? If I can 80 to 90% of the time or more hit a pie plate, a vital distance, whatever, then you have business. This is my opinion. Everybody's got their thing. Sure. And shooting an animal at that distance, as long as the energy carries it out far enough to take down the animal, you know, at that distance. And so, you know, we certainly don't claim numbers or yardage or whatever those things are, because based on your setup and based on your own physical ability and your experience as a shooter, all those things are going to play into it. But no doubt the, 
it, to me, the acceptable distance, you know, versus some of the old technologies, old scopes, flatter shooting stuff, you know, those things have changed. And, and the and days of the 30 odd six being kind of the, the elk hunting rifle now, exactly. when you think about, you know, a lot of the seven mags, the three hundreds, the six point fives, I mean, can now, you know, and I think to your point, and, and I think that's important is, is anyone can come to a show or, or go to one of these manufacturers out of the box, spend a lot of money and buy yeah. a rifle that's going to shoot, you know, a thousand yards. Right. But if they've never done it before, right. Or if they're if not proficient in, at if it. If it's in 30 knot winds, if they have to stand up, Total all different that game. changes. Yeah. I just, so I, I took an elk down in one shot this year with a 300 Weatherby 180 nozzle Acubon bullet um, at 525 yards. But for that particular shot, um, I was prone with this cool carbon fiber Spartan bipod I use. Not only did I have the bipod on the front, I had my day pack on my buttstock on the back. I was prone. He was feeding in the early morning light. He was standing broadside, and there was zero wind. I mean, it, conditions and are perfect it leveled at that him point. better than I've shot some animals at 100 yards. Conditions were perfect. Um, I had, at that time, I had a vortex scope on that particular hunt. I had my app all dialed in, so I knew the BC of that bullet. I knew it was 10 half-inch clicks based on my zero. I clicked it. It was a heart-long shot, and the story was over. It doesn't always come out that way. I have passed up plenty of shots at 500 yards because all of those things didn't line up. Sure. Um, you know, in fact, the week before that, I'd been in Wyoming, and I passed up a 480-yard shot on an elk. Um, it was Wyoming wind. <laughs> it was howling, and I didn't have as good of a position. All those things said, no, I'm not comfortable taking that shot at all. So it totally, I think, depends. You know? and, I always, and I've always said, I mean, if you're proficient out to 1,000 yards and you've done it and, you know, you, you've got the capability and the capacity to do it, it's ethical, right? Yeah. But if you just set someone down prone under, yes. under a, you know, a rifle that's never done that, it's a totally different situation. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. Good. No, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, so maybe we'll talk a little bit about hunting since you mm -hmm. were kind of going there. Um, sure. You know, maybe reflecting back on 17, you, and I was kind of following you from social media. You had a, you had a pretty awesome year. And, yeah. And I know one of the things that, that stood out to me, you know, was your sheep hunt and drawing in Oregon, which is, you know, next to almost impossible being a non-resident. But maybe speak a little bit to, you know, last year and if maybe that hunt, if there's something that kind of stood out for you uh, last year in your in your hunting expedition. Sure. No, I mean, to, to draw an Oregon bighorn sheep tag is something you want to be talking about for years. <laughs> so, you know, I'm a non-resident. I believe there's six non-residents a year drawn for Bighorn Sheep Tag in Oregon. I may be off on that. Six or eight. Yeah, it's not it's, many. It's less than 10. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I drew in the South Central Union of Oregon um, and hadn't been putting in a lot of years. So people get upset with me. It's like, dude, I got lucky, man. And they think, well, you're Adam Weatherby. You knew somebody whatever. I'm like, dude, I just said I drew. Yeah, I just drew like anybody else. I yeah. just got lucky. Um, I actually drew a New Mexico unit 34 bull elk tag last year too. So I don't expect to draw anything for like five years because it was, it was a good year for yeah. me. Um, and, uh, so I, yeah, I was just blessed. I mean, I, I shot a doll's, uh, sheep up in Northwest territories in 15 and I kind of figured, well, I don't know. I'll just wait and I'll put in. And so when I drew that, it was like, no way I'm, I, I might get my big horn. <laughs> so, um, you're halfway there. So I was exciting. Ended up doing a do it yourself with some friends. Um, Randy and Candy Yao, and they live up in Lapine, Oregon. I knew they knew that territory real well and headed out in a jumping jack trailer and went out in the BLM. And there's probably 10 of us on opening day for my tag, my wife and our bird dog, and everybody came up. And That's neat. And, um, yeah, I uh, ended up shooting my ram on the fifth day. Um, so it was, I mean, it was hot. It's a late August hunt, so it's different. You know, California bighorn's unique in that it's a subspecies of Rocky Mountain bighorn, but it, to me it has some desert you know, bighorn and even certainly the environment characteristics to it, but it's technically, they categorize it, you know, as a Rocky it's Mountain. A big, yep, bighorn. Um, but, uh, but, you know, we were hunting in some hot weather, so it was different, you know, where my Northwest Territories hunt had snowed on me, and this one it was like, I was just boiling hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, almost almost polar opposite conditions. <laughs> right. Mackenzie Mountains versus, yes. yeah. Yes, And when was the season? Was it August? August. I had the first season, which is which is better for as far as for, you know, get, we get the first first shot at. There's eight hunters, first four season and first second season um, in that area. Um, I was the fourth, actually, to pull the trigger, so I was the final of that first season. Uh, my ram measured out about 160 inches. Um, there were two low 150s. Great sheep. Two low 150s and then a 163. Interesting about that, you know, there's been a lot of drought. So they used to pull a lot of 170 plusers out of that area. Um, but there's been like, even if you look at the, the rings on, you know, my ram's horns is, you know, one year it's like half inch and then the next year it's like four inches. So you can almost see the growth, growth rate of annuli right. on the horn based so on the, the biologist the who's here at the show, John, his name's John Muir. 
like crazy yes, his enough. name is John Muir, like the you know the painter, like the really famous photographer, right? In yeah, the Yosemite. Ex- and yeah, explorer, you know, trailblazer guy, and you know, uh, anyways, he his name's John Muir, so he was a biologist. He said, "Dude, this is man as good a Rams get." Now there was a one sixty three shot. I was one sixty. I saw him here, and I went up to him like, "So second season." Uh, what did everybody take? He goes, oh, they're all smaller than yours, except it was a 168. And I was like, no way, where was it? So he told me kind of, you know, the you mean general area it was in or wherever. Um, so once in a while, you, you pull a, a good ram from there. But it's not, you think Rocky Mountain Big Ram, it's not like a Montana, it's not you a know, break governor's sheet, tag yeah. or something. You know? It's not the 200-inch <laughs> no. Missouri breaks. Dude, yeah. what's that one on display here? It's 202? The or? Goliath one, the no. one over it. Oh, no, not Kuyu's, but um, not the desert, but the Rocky Mountain right inside there. Oh, it's like, Anyways. isn't that 208? Or? Yeah, it's 20-something. Unbelievable. Phenomenal. But to me, it's like I was out there sheep hunting. We just had a blast. And, you know, at the end of the day, I got a nice ram. I was You had really, a sheep tag really in your pocket. Happy. I did. And I filled it even better yet. So, um, yeah, it so was So it was good. funny when I was reading your story, you talked mm-hmm. about, you know, you drew the tag, but you had the bug. And so here you're yeah. at the sheep show, right? I mean, I are, you, well, are you now considering? I mean, well, I mean, now it's the problem is the problem is I got the easier too. That's and, true. You know, so now I got a stone, which... Is just expensive so no matter how you look money. at it. It's going to yeah. cost money. And then the desert is either going to cost a lot of money or a lot of years. Yeah. One of the two. Exactly. So I'm now down to money or time. The first two were easier. It was, you know, the, the dolls is the cheapest of the four. And then the other one I just drew. So I'm not pushing anything. And I'm putting in for lucky, you know, just stuff. Like here you can put in and get in a drawing for a stone. And just, you know, kind of we're waiting for a right opportunity. But I don't have a plan. My plan is b- before I die... It'd be cool to fill a slam. Get all four. Yeah. yeah. But um, I'm not planning on dying soon, so we'll see yeah. how that goes. No, <laughs> got plenty of years to, to do that, Hopefully. and you're halfway there. Yeah. So, so that's yeah. pretty neat. It was fun. Yeah. Thinking about 2018 yeah. uh, from an application and, you know, um, you know, putting in standpoint for different hunts. Is there anything you have on your radar this year that you're kind of looking at maybe for, for this season? You know, man, this season's a lot. Where last year I had, I had five good hunts, really, that I did. Uh, you know, a whitetail, California blacktail. Um, let's see, had the two elk hunts, elk hunts New yeah. Mexico, Wyoming, and then that sheep hunt. So, um, so this year's a lot more dry right now, but last year I went in, planned it heavy, and then I drew a bunch. So maybe I'm just used to that. I'm, um, I'm planning on doing a bear hunt, black bear hunt with my son and, uh, our Australian, um, a guy from Australia that sells our guns down there and, and a good friend, he's going to come up. And so, uh, plan on doing, doing a bear hunt. Cool. Um, I, I plan right now, you know, my kids only have a few years left in high school and things. So probably take my, my daughter, I think we're going to do an elk hunt. Um, so, you know, trying to do some things kind of around that and then just different things present itself. Got some different things in the pipe, but nothing too big yet. You know, buddy the other day wanted to go to New Zealand this year. I said, no, no, it was in New Zealand this year, but, um, that's on the bucket list too. Sure. I haven't done that yet, but yeah. uh, there's so many things. I just love North American Western big game hunting. There's so many, I know so many great, great, you know, hunting opportunities here. It's um, hard to leave the kind of, I mean, you know, going to Africa, yeah. New Zealand are mm-hmm. very desirable places, but it's hard to leave when you can go on over the counter elk in Colorado it or, is. you know, it is. Yeah. Over the counter elk in Idaho. And I mean, and then plus you can just, you know, can load up your meat. You just don't have to worry about everything. Yep. It's just so easy, but there's, you know, that's, what's fun about hunting. You, you've never really arrived to that pinnacle. Exactly. You know? I mean, 99% of hunters anyways. Yeah. But yeah. Um, Adam, maybe speak a little bit to, you know, kind of community outreach from Weatherby, you know, just beyond the firearms name. I mean, you know, community in, in terms of Team Weatherby, you know, women of Weatherby, Weatherby TV. I mean, there's so many things that you guys do that, that yeah. touch more than just the firearm industry. Sure. I mean, we, yeah, we do try to, you know, we understand for the future of hunting and conservation that we, um, it can't just be grandpa's passing it down to dads or moms or whatever it is and kind of moving on that way that there there is a new demographic rising i think um of people that are out there um you know getting involved in hunting and so i think um one of the unique things that we've done the past few years is we you know i've had some pro staff that aren't in the hunting world at all they're just their nfl players or their mma fighters or you know you name it you know we country music singers and so we've tried to kind of branch out where we can really bring some new folks in. There's different organizations, you know, that are doing that. I think Backcountry Hunters and Anglers is, you know, probably hitting that in that demographic, um, probably, you know, the strongest. But the idea is that, um, you know, I think historically, even with our products and my grandpa and the Mark Five Deluxe and all those things is, you know, th- those guys weren't getting any younger. And um, we love those customers, but they weren't going to live forever. And there's even from a business standpoint from hunting, from conservation, we have to figure out what does hunting look like in the future. And so we're an active part of many, many conservation groups, including wild sheep, um, you know, um, that are out there. Um, I just joined the Mule Deer Foundation uh, National Board. Um, So I'll be stepping on here 
um, here this spring, you know, onto that and to be, be a part of that. And so we, we try to be involved on a number of fronts in order to just, um, you know, really keep things, keep things moving and keep things going. Yeah. And I think it's so so important when, you know, as kids, we, you know, we've had the ability to hunt and, you know, when you said, you know, like my, my growing up in Montana, I mean, it was simple to go out and deer hunt and elk hunt, but you think about in 20 years, is that opportunity going to be there for the next generation? So, you know, the more we can, you know, promote companies like BHA and other organizations to, to help, you know, keep our hunting rights and in public lands from going, you know, privatization and all that is so critical in times right now, um, going forward. So it's neat to see that you guys are advocates and, 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 no, we want to be a big, yeah. big part of that, and and I believe we are with you know many organizations. There's a lot of good people out yeah. there doing a lot of good a lot things. of good things happening. Yeah, absolutely. So thinking about 2018, you know, for Weatherby, um, you know, and and you can kind of go in if there's anything you know from a from a product standpoint that really jumps out at you, like you know this could be a transcender or anything that's happening in in the, in the Weatherby space. Sure. No, I appreciate it. I think you know on the product side. You know, we are, you know, we did actually just this morning, we launched a carbon mark, carbon fiber barrel, uh, mark five, and just did that first light gun last Friday. So we're um, just launched a, um, our uh, Camilla, the women's rifle in uh, um, one in Sika subalpine. So, um, you know, there's a lot of new things that we're doing there. Um, there's gonna be some new new cartridge development we're working on that I can't, can't share with the public. Uh, no, but you know, we, uh, we're always working on a lot of stuff. So even throughout this year, between now and the end of this year, we're going to come out with a, a, it's going to be a big year for Weatherby as far as product releases. Um, one of the biggest things, um, you know, that we're actually going to be announcing next Tuesday, um, at, at SHOT Show, um, you know, by the time this podcast comes out, I think it'll be it'll live be, it'll, yep. and then we can share it'll it. It'll be public record. But, by uh, but, but Tuesday at four o'clock during SHOT on January 23rd, we are going to be announcing, um, a significant part in the Weatherby history. Um, and that is, we are going to be relocating from California to the state of Wyoming. Wow. And that's uh, huge. It's really big. I mean, we've, um, we've been in California since 1945, um, you know, I got one employee that's worked for us for 57 years. And so it's, um, you know, we are, you know, I mean, you're in the local community there. I mean, it's a great place. It's so many different ways in the past rules area. But due to a lot of different reasons, it was going to be in Weatherby's long-term best interest um, to relocate. Um, we looked at a lot of great, you know, Western states. We are just, we're a Western company and knew we needed to kind of be Rockies and West somewhere. Yeah. And, uh, and so, um, Wyoming, uh, in fact, last year at SHOT Show met with the governor and his team of people and they just said, Adam, we, we would love for your brand to be in our state and man, we'll do what it takes to get you here. And they've done it. And so, um, in fact, just yesterday, um, uh, the governor and his team of people voted on the kind of a, the major incentive that they were working on for us, and it got passed unanimously by that board. And wow! So uh, four days from now, we're going to be announcing it in a shot that we'll be up up and pulling out. There'll be a large, you know, transition period here this next year, kind of doing that and relocating and finding new good employees. Uh, we're going to be in Sheridan, Wyoming, right up nestled into the Bighorn Mountains. Um, moose, 30, 45 minutes, you know, yeah. right from our office. Good um, elk hunting in the big horns. Great elk yeah. hunting in the big horns. My wife just shot a white tail, probably about 15 to 20 minutes from our uh, building site that we're going to be building something in this year. And, um, and so a great area access to outdoors, all those different things. So it's going to be long-term, um, you know, from, uh, whether it be ta- tax structure, regulations, um, upholding the second amendment in so many different ways. Uh, Wyoming was everything we were looking for and we're, really thrilled about it. It's, um, not gonna lie. It's gonna be a ton of work this next year. (laughs) Like it's just enough work, you know, staying in business and growing and trying to be innovative and do those things. So it's going to be a lot of work. Um, but we're up for the task and I know, you know, if we want for this, um, you know, that for the opportunity I've had for future generations of Weatherby's to be able to carry on that same legacy, um, it was obvious to us a relocation was in our future. So, yeah, and that's huge. I think about, you know, for companies to, to, to thrive and to compete with, you know, with competition, I think about, you know, your grandpa and your dad and, and California has been such a great place to live, a great place to, to, you know, to work. The weather's not bad. And the weather's pretty good. Yeah. (laughs) And by the way, there's actually a lot of good hunting in California too. (laughs) Most people don't know about, but you know, I think to your point, I mean, the vision of Weatherby, this is what it needs to do to get to the next level. And and I think it's neat that, you know, you know, to be innovative and challenge convention that you guys are looking at that and stepping out and, and, uh, and doing that for the company, for the better benefit of the company. Absolutely. Yeah. That's huge. So yeah, that's kind of, there's a lot on our radar, but that one's, that one's a big one for us. I mean, building a building and hiring tons of people. I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be a big year um, of transition. Um, In the midst of it though, we're not, we're not slowing down. I mean, our business or our new product introductions, um, you know, everything, um, you know, 
continuous improvement. I mean, we're still going to be doing that. So yeah. it's going to be a busy Exciting. year. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, Adam, just kind of to wrap this up, yeah. um, what additional trade shows? So you already talked about SHOT Show um, and you guys have, you guys were, uh, um, were you, or you guys weren't at Dallas Safari. We saw you at Dallas Safari yes, for, yes. for Craig's event, but yeah. what other, um, what other trade shows you guys have planned for the, for this circuit? Sure. We'll be, uh, we'll be at the Western Expo, um, the Mule Deer Foundation hosts in Salt Lake here in a few weeks. And it's a big show for us. It's a, it's a great show. Um, I think if, if you know any listeners haven't been out there, it's a great one to hit. I, I personally is. love it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's just Western big game hunting and it's really, I think grown a lot the last few years. And, um, so we'll have, we'll, a full booth and display and would love for any of your listeners to come out and see us at that. So that'll be the next after shot. And, um, you know, then other conservation groups, you know, we knew, uh, national wild Turkey, um, and then, uh, NRA is always a big one for us. So we'll be, um, back in Dallas, right? Man, it's so funny, right? When you ask them like all these years and shows, everything, all these cities get mixed up. Is I know. It, is it in Dallas? It is back okay, in Dallas. Then I'm going to trust is, you. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, NRA is in Dallas. So we'll be out there for NRA and in May. we always do some new product releases there. Um, so yeah, so we'll be around and then a bunch of dealer and distributor shows and things like that too. So yeah. Really cool. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of neat things uh, happen in the in the Weatherby space, and yeah. a lot of exciting news. So absolutely, uh, yeah. need to need to have you on, Adam. Um, and again, it, it's it's uh, you know I was thinking about when uh, we were up in Dallas here just a few weeks ago, and what a neat uh, you know neat banquet that was had for Craig when you know the Weatherby Award, which absolutely. is a huge yeah. obviously deal to yeah. you guys and, yeah. and your name. And, so happy uh, for Craig too. And so, uh, yeah, yeah, and it was it was interesting because as you talked to folks in the room you know basically what they said is you know this was overdue for him i mean he he was the guy that didn't go out and do what he did for the award he did yeah. it because he loved to do sure. it right and uh you know for you guys to obviously have that award you know and and then to have someone near dear to our heart who's a local who's a neighbor who's a friend when it was was pretty spectacular to be there and share that with them so yeah that was neat another local paso robles guy that's right california yeah. so yeah. yeah craig's a Craig, good guy he is he is well, cool. Uh, Adam, thanks again. Um, yeah. How can people get a hold of you? I mean, obviously you've got the website, social media, but what's kind of the best way if, if someone's interested in looking at a new Weatherby, a Mark V, a shotgun? I mean, what, what, what I mean, would we you got, recommend? Yeah, I mean, we got, I mean, in addition to just whatever your normal online stuff and, you know, I post a lot of stuff. You can find me on Instagram or Facebook or those things too, and I'm always trying to kind of be an ambassador for the brand, obviously. And um, But, man, you can just always give us a call. I mean, we're not some big corporate headquarters. I mean, you know, Josh, who's in the booth here, he answers the phone back at Weatherby and a team full of other people. And so, I mean, any product questions, just, you know, we got a great customer service team, too, that can just, you know, answer anything. Um, and, uh, yeah, so, I mean, just give us a phone call, too. So, I mean, okay. there's... I know in today's day and age, it's it's like foreign to kind of do that. It's like, wait, yeah. you dial people on this? But talking to a live human being is kind of fun sometimes, so we're there for you. <laughs> they actually have a, a normal line. They don't have a cell phone. I can't text that. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, Adam, uh, it was great to have you on. Wish yeah. um, you and Brenda success Thanks. with this with this you know exciting news and obviously huge move, not only um, personally to, to uproot and leave it such a great state that's been so great to you guys uh, but uh, also to you know look forward to, to new adventures and new exciting things for you guys it's gonna so, be fun it's yeah. gonna be fun so cool. cool well good luck thanks again and appreciate having you on the show thanks for having me appreciate it hey everyone this is lucas paw host of the RNA Outdoors podcast, please check out Podbean and iTunes. If you have an iPhone or iPad, go to the podcast app on your device, search for RNA Outdoors, and hit the purple subscribe button. When doing this, it will automatically upload when new podcasts are loaded, and they will download into your queue. For Android users, you can access the podcast through Podbean, Stitcher, or use our website, www.rnaoutdoors.com forward slash podcast. In addition, under the RNA Outdoors podcast channel, please leave a review and a five-star rating. These reviews help boost our popularity and outreach. You can also follow us on our social media outlets, Twitter at RNA Outdoors, Facebook, RNA Outdoors, and Instagram, Rod and Arrow Outdoors. All links are in the show notes as well. If you like what you've heard, we hope you'll pass along our channel to your friends and colleagues. Keep up the good fight. We cannot sit by and watch the public lands devoted to wildlife protection wither away. There's simply too much at stake. Make your voice heard, speak up, 
and get involved with conservation efforts and know that every little bit helps. As we say on the mountain, go farther, stay longer.